Hello and welcome back to Mr. Rowe Science. Today I'm going to do something slightly different that isn't on a GCSE specification. I'm going to talk about the novel coronavirus in China, which lots of people are discussing at the moment, having just arrived in the UK. So first of all, let's talk about the structure of the virus and what it actually looks like. Um, this diagram shows what the virus is like, and it's got in the centre single-stranded RNA, so it doesn't contain DNA like we do in our genome, it contains just a single strand of RNA. Around that it's got a, a protein layer, so this is a, an envelope it's called, which contains the, the RNA and it gives it a little bit of protection against the elements so the virus can survive in the atmosphere for a while after it's been um, put into the air. Coming out of the envelope we have a couple of different things. You've got some glycoprotein spikes, so these are a, a molecule which is a combination of carbohydrates and protein. You've also got a particular protein which lots of viruses have, which is called hemagglutinin. So what this does is it allows binding of the virus with human cells. So when it's infecting people, the hemagglutinin is particularly important. We'll come back to the structure of it later because it's really relevant for how we might develop treatments for it one day. Okay, so that's what it is. Next we'll have a quick look at where the virus actually came from. So what this is an example of with the coronavirus is something called zoonosis. So zoonosis is where it's come from an animal in the wild rather than coming from humans originally. In this case the most likely um, source of it is going to be bats in that region of China. Um, there was a theory earlier on about snakes but now bats look like the most likely source of the virus. And with it coming from bats, it's particularly dangerous for humans. And the reason why that's the case is because we haven't had time to develop any natural immunity to it. So for most diseases, we could um, draw a diagram which looks a bit like this. So what the, the key shows is the, the green blobs are going to be individuals who are immune to the disease. So this could be because they're vaccinated, it could be because they've already caught it. The ones in red are going to be the ones who are vulnerable to the disease, so they're not immune and they can still catch it. For most diseases we've got something called herd immunity, so particularly for things where there's vaccinations, there's so many people who are immune to it in a population that it finds it very hard to spread because there aren't enough vulnerable people to pass it from um, carrier to carrier. But for something which has recently come in from an animal, such as the coronavirus, there's going to be no herd immunity which exists because a small number of people are going to be naturally immune to it but the vast majority of the population has never come across this virus before so they're going to have very little immunity so that's why it can sweep really fast through a population there's plenty of carriers for it to go through and we've not had time to evolve it and adapt and develop any defenses against this particular strain of the virus so Coming up with a vaccine, that's what we're looking at doing really, to um, try to make it a lot safer because if we have a vaccine rolled out, it develops this herd immunity so less people can catch it. There's been some good news stories about this recently and people are working on it and trying to develop it, but we're still as a minimum several weeks away from developing a vaccine which would then have to be made and shipped out to everybody who needs it. What they're doing though, when they're looking at making a vaccine, is they're considering the structure of the virus particle. So in particular, if you can find a vaccine which targets the hemagglutinin protein, that's going to be a really good thing to use because the virus has to have it to enter human cells. So if it adapts by losing it to get around the vaccination, then it's not actually infectious anymore and it's no longer a problem. Another potential target would be the glycoprotein spikes if they have a particular glycoprotein that's not found elsewhere. Again, if we could find a vaccine which causes you to develop um, an immune response against those and you produce antibodies, then if you have the virus inside your body, it would attack the glycoprotein spikes and your immune system would be able to fight it off. The only slight issue with those is because the virus doesn't absolutely need them to have that um, molecule for their function, it could adapt or mutate in a way that it changes the glycoprotein to get around any potential vaccination. So to finish off, how serious is this actually at the moment? Because there's lots of really bad news stories about it, but at the same time, the spread is quite limited. So at the moment, the, the bad news is it seems to be 
not incredibly highly infectious, but it's at, at least very infectious. So what that means is that for an epidemic to be sustained, when one person has it, they need to infect at least two others. And we seem to be well over that threshold. Each person that gets it seems to be able to infect several other people, probably because the particles become airborne when they cough and sneeze. And that means the epidemic's then going to spread because each time that happens, you're increasing the number of people infected. So that's what's needed for the virus to spread. And we are in that category. That's why it's going to other countries and it's now in every province in China. It's spreading quite fast. But perhaps the slightly better news about it is at the moment it's got around a 1% fatality rate. So that's both good and bad news compared to other viruses. So if we look at Ebola, which there was a lot of talk about recently, that can have upwards of 40% fatality depending on the strain. So that's a lot more dangerous than coronaviruses if you happen to catch it. And as well, with my old man here, most people who have caught and died coronavirus are actually people who have got other serious medical conditions or who are old themselves. So obviously for those groups of people that's not good news, but again there's other things which are a lot worse at targeting people who are healthy and younger people, which means it spreads even faster and causes more fatality. So there's reasons to be both optimistic and pessimistic. Really though, I think everything we're doing to guard against the virus is definitely deserved and we perhaps should be doing a little bit more. And that's because even if it's only got 1% fatality, the population of the UK is around 70 million. So if we find out what 1% of that is, that's actually 700,000 people. So if the virus doesn't change in any way, and everybody in the UK were to catch it, big assumptions, but that would lead to potentially 700,000 people dying, which is a huge number. So although 1% is small, the total number of casualties should be huge. So in summary for this, do we need to be worried? I think we do need to be worried, but I think it's also possible to overreact to something like this. There have been other viruses, such as Ebola, such as SARS, which people were equally worried about in the past. And in the end, although they caused serious outbreaks, they didn't spread to the whole world population and cause millions of deaths. It's most likely the same thing is going to happen with coronavirus. But what we need is scientists looking for vaccines to guard against threats like this and to improve biosecurity so people are less likely to catch diseases from animals in the future.